Okay, good morning everyone. Sawadee Kaap. Welcome to Wat Tung Yu. Nice to see all of you guys here this morning. Welcome to all of you guys here at the temple and welcome to everyone who's joining us online as well. Today is what we call our group learning program and I'm in the second class of a three-part series where each Sunday over the past one Sunday today and then next Sunday, I'm teaching students what's called the Eightfold Path. This is the core central teaching of the Buddha, whereas if you're interested in getting to enlightenment, you would need to know this teaching inside and out, backwards and forwards. And what we do is we start our class with meditation and then afterwards I'll move into sharing with you the Eightfold Path. Today we're talking about the moral conduct section, which is called right speech, right action, and right livelihood. We're going to use the original words of the Buddha where you're going to be learning about what's called the natural law of gamma, of cause and effect or action and result, understanding how when you make decisions around your speech or actions in your livelihood, whatever you put out, it's going to come back to you. If you cause harm, harmful things are going to come back to you. Unwholesome results are going to be experienced. But when you understand the wisdom of the Buddha and you're making wise decisions about your moral conduct, then you'll experience wholesome things coming back to you as well. So I'm going to explain that to you after we do our meditation. So the way that we do our meditation is we start with some chanting. We kind of ease the mind into meditation. There's chanting sheets on the back table over there. There's a laminated sheet because the chanting that we do is in the Pali language. You're welcome to help yourself to a chanting sheet. I think Steve might actually end up handing them out. He usually does that. Um, these Pali chants, they have the English translations. And for those of you guys that are online, if you'd like to see this, you can go to our website, buddhadailywisdom.com and click on free books. And there you'll see towards the bottom, the free resources where you'll see the chanting sheets. These chants, I suspect that they were created by the Buddhist students, either during his life or after his death. Because if you read the English translations, there's a lot of respect, a lot of admiration, a lot of gratitude for the Buddha in these chants. And the Buddha is not going to go around and teach people to chant to him and kind of, uh, you know, admire him because he would have eliminated his ego, his arrogance, his boastfulness, his pride. He wouldn't have gone around and taught people to chant these things to him. These chants that we do, they're not mystical or magical. There's no rite or ritual or ceremony or worship that's part of the teachings of the Buddha. This isn't even prayer. I suspect that the students had a lot of respect and admiration and gratitude for the Buddha because if you learned how to move from sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, stress, anxiety, boredom, loneliness, shyness, resentment, jealousy, and you move to this peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind, which is the enlightened mind, where you're joyful all the time, you would have a lot of respect and admiration for that teacher that helped you to do that. The Buddha didn't want anything or expect anything from his students. He just shared his teachings to be able to help people understand how to move to this enlightened mental state. So if somebody helped you to get to the point where your mind's peaceful and joyful for the rest of your life, and you're no longer experiencing any kind of even the slightest bad mood, you would have a lot of respect and gratitude for that person too. So I suspect that they created these chants either during his life or after his death as a way to have gratitude and respect for the Buddha. Today, I chant them for those reasons, but also I chant it in order to ease the mind into meditation and get more benefit out of the meditation itself. So you're welcome to chant along if you like. And some of the various programs and courses that I teach, I actually teach people how to do the chanting. Today, we're not focused on that, but you're welcome to chant along if you like. So I'll ease into meditation with some chanting. Then once we get into the meditation, I'll provide some guidance to be able to help you understand how to meditate while we're actually meditating together. Then there'll be a period of time where it'll just be quiet and we'll be meditating. Those of us here at the temple and everyone joining us online, we'll just all be meditating together at the same time. And then after that, we'll come out of the meditation with some more chanting as well. And that's where I'll move into the class and teaching you guys the Eightfold Path, the moral conduct section of right speech, right action, and right livelihood. Uh, as you are meditating, I'm sure you're going to hear the occasional dog barking or a car going by or something like this. All of these sounds are impermanent. And I'll share with you in the meditation about what to do when your mind is moving around and jumping around. You'll learn how to train your mind during the meditation itself. In terms of your body positioning, there's four positions to meditate in. They're seated, lying, standing, and walking. And Oftentimes, students are learning in the seated position, either sitting in a chair or sitting on the floor or somehow sitting. So I'll just give you a little bit of guidance on sitting. 
there's not just one fixed way to actually do this, but I'll just give you a couple of tips, a couple of pointers, and you find what's comfortable for you. If you're on the floor, you might just have your legs lightly crossed, whereas if they're real tight, you'll impede the circulation and you might experience pain as you're going through the meditation. So you're not interested in experiencing any pain during the meditation. So just have your legs lightly crossed. Some people like to put their legs off the mat. This gets the hips up in the air and lessens the angle at the hips, the knees, and the ankles. And this will help you to keep the body uh, pain-free as well. The Buddha put his right hand over his left with his thumbs together and he placed this into his lap. If this is comfortable for you, you could use it. But this practice isn't about everybody doing it exactly the same way. That's actually impossible. So if you find this comfortable, feel free to use it. But there's other options here as well. You could put your palms on your thighs, on your knees. You could put palms up. You could rest your hands comfortably in your lap. There's all kinds of options here. So you'd like your lower body and the hands and arms to be comfortable. And if you decide to sit in a chair, some people like to sit with their feet flat on the floor or lightly cross at the ankles. And then again, with their hands and arms wherever is comfortable for them. The upper body should be erect. This keeps the mind attentive and alert during the meditation. Whereas if you were slouched, the mind would have a tendency to be dull or lethargic. But if you are real rigid, uh, the mind could be overactive or uptight. So you'd like the upper body to be erect, which is in the middle. This is with the sternum up and the shoulders back. It helps to keep the mind attentive and alert during the meditation. It also helps you to breathe because you can fill up your lungs nice and easily. So again, I'm going to ease us into meditation with chanting, which you're welcome to join along in. And then I'll be back with some guidance on the meditation itself. <clears throat> Otang make one hung up, he watered me. Savakato make Supatipano Makuato Savakasanko Sankang Namami Napmurhasa Pakuato Arato Sama Saputasa Napmurhasa Pakuato Arato Sama Saputasa Napmurhasa Pakuato Arato Sama Saputasa Iti Piso Makawa Arahang Sama Samoto We cha cha ranang samuno Sakato roka wito Anu tero purisa Nama sati sata tawap manu asanang Oto pakewati Okay, with the lower body and hands and arms comfortable In the upper body erect just close the eyes, 
Start breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. Here you're just looking to establish the breath. A nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. Not forced or controlled. Just a gradual inhale through the nose. Experiencing the full breath. And then whenever you're ready, exhale out through the nose. Breathing in. And out. Breathing in and out. Your breath may not match up with the guidance that I'm providing, and that's okay. This is your practice. I'm just here for guidance. You can use this voice as a reminder. That whenever you get to the next inhale, breathing gradually through the nose, developing a nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. And then whenever you're ready, exhale out through the nose, experiencing the full breath. Breathing in. and out. Breathing in and out. With the breath well developed, start fixating the mind on the breath. Either the sound of the breath coming into the nose or the sensation of air moving over the skin into the nose. The breath is the present moment. Fixate the mind on the breath, the present moment. Breathing in. in out breathing in and out with the mind fixated on the breath Whenever you notice that it moves off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. No need to observe the thought, label it, judge it, analyze it, or even try to figure out where it's coming from. Whenever you notice that the mind is moved off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath the present moment. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. I'm going to be quiet now and let you do this work of focusing on the breath, cutting off and letting go anytime the mind moves off the breath. You have nowhere to go. 
there's nothing to do. No one needs you right now. This is your time to focus on the breath. Breathing in. and out.
your way out of meditation. I'd like to once again welcome all of you guys, including everyone who joined us since we started meditating. Welcome to you, those of you that are here at the temple and everyone who's joining us online, welcome. For those of you guys that are here at the temple, if this is your first time here, I'd like to let you know that there's a bathroom in the back of the room, the very last door on the right. You're welcome to use that as as you like. There's even bathrooms outside this classroom. If you go outside the door and you follow the signs around, it'll take you to the main temple bathroom where you're welcome to use that at any point that you like. We even have water here that is provided by our students that you're welcome to help yourself to. At any point, feel free to make yourself comfortable, make yourself at home. So this program that I teach on Sundays and Wednesdays, it's called the group learning program. And what I do is over a period of seven months, I walk students through the foundational teachings that it takes in order to move the mind to this enlightened mental state where the mind's peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. That by the time you get to enlightenment, you no longer experience any discontent feelings. There's no anger, sadness, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, stress, anxiety, all the boredom and loneliness, shyness, resentment, jealousy, even the slightest displeasure is eliminated from the enlightened mind. And you do that through training of the mind. And I do this over a period of seven months where I'm gradually walking students through helping them to understand the teachings. You wouldn't get to enlightenment in seven months, but you'll have a foundation of what it takes to be able to get to enlightenment. And we use this first book of this book series over there on the bookshelf. And you can also get this book series through our website for free. You can just download it for free. You can uh, take it and go print it if 
you like. You can get printed versions here at the temple or you can get them online through Amazon if you like. This first book is called Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Enlightenment. And each Sunday I walk students through chapter by chapter. But here we just started this program at the beginning about two weeks ago, two or three weeks ago. We started from the very beginning and I'm walking students through. And what I do at the beginning of the program is the first four or five weeks or so, I kind of give students an overview of the teachings of the Buddha and kind of dive deeply into one of the very core teachings of the Buddha, which is called the Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path is the core central teachings of the Buddha. And this is what you're learning in order to make your way to enlightenment. And last week, I taught this wisdom section of right view and right intention. And today is about learning the moral conduct section, which is right speech, right action, right livelihood. What right view and right intention are teaching you is essentially that your mind is causing all your own anger, sadness, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, all those disconsent feelings. It's actually being caused by your own mind. Oftentimes in the unenlightened state, we blame our feelings on other people. We think that mom is making me angry or dad is annoying me or brothers and sisters are doing this particular thing wrong and they need to do it a different way. But this is the mind's craving, desire, attachment, the longing, the yearning, wanting things to be a certain way. And if the mind gets what it wants and people do things the way you want, you get pleasant feelings, you get happy, you get excited excited or you get elated, you get pleasant feelings. But if they don't do things the way you want them to do, then the mind experiences painful feelings. This is all based in craving, desire, attachment. And if you understand that your mind is causing your own disconsent feelings through right view, this is very empowering because if you can understand that your mind's causing these feelings itself, then that means you can actually eliminate them. Oftentimes in the unenlightened state, we go out into the world and we try to change other people to do things our way. And we think that that's the way that we're going to get to peace. Or we might think that there's a bunch of rules that everybody has to follow. And if everybody follows these rules, then the world will become a more peaceful place. But this isn't actually true. This isn't how the Buddha taught. And this isn't what's going to lead to your peacefulness. What's going to lead to your peacefulness is to understand your own mind and understand the world around you. And then when you understand the world around you with wisdom, you won't struggle and have have difficulties any longer. The unenlightened mind is struggling and having difficulties. That's the anger and the sadness and all those other discontent feelings that it lacks wisdom about the natural laws of existence. And as long as you lack wisdom about the natural laws of existence, you'll struggle and you have difficulties in the world. So when I teach you guys this moral conduct section, you're going to be learning what's called the natural law of gamma, of cause and effect or action and result. You're going to understand these natural laws and by awakening to this wisdom, you'll be able to make wiser decisions in your life or you'll be able to conduct your life with ease. You don't need to go out into the world and train other people how to do things your way. When your mind becomes angered or frustrated or, or sad or some other discontent feeling, you might push people away out of your life. This is what the unenlightened mind will do is it falsely believes the problem is external. So it'll usually push people or push a situation out of your life. This is called aversion. But you can see that this doesn't solve the problem because you just keep getting agitated or angry or annoyed about something else. It's only a matter of time. So when you push people away, it doesn't actually solve your problems. The other thing that the unenlightened mind will tend to do is it'll become bitter and harsh and hostile towards people. It'll be aggressive. Uh, through your intentions, your speech, and your actions. And when you're doing that, people might be driven away from you. They might choose to go away from you because they're not interested in being around the harshness and the bitterness. Or the third thing that you might do in the unenlightened state is put your expectations on people and try to control people to do things your way and kind of pressure them into doing things a certain way. And this is the unenlightened mind just misunderstanding what the true problem is. The mind is thinking that the problem is external. So the problem that the mind perceives, which is a misunderstanding, understanding is that the mind thinks that if I push this person away, that solves the problem. Or if I'm bitter, harsh, and hostile, it'll kind of fear them or guilt them or shame them into doing things my way. Or if you put your expectations on someone, the same thing. The mind's trying to get its cravings fulfilled because it's misunderstanding the true problem. But what right view is helping you to understand, and I walk students through this with the Four Noble Truths, is helping them to understand what's truly causing these feelings in your mind. Because then when you truly understand what's causing these feelings, you can then actually eliminate them. But if you don't understand what's causing these feelings, you wouldn't actually be able to eliminate them. So it's actually these pollutions in the mind that the Buddha discovered referred to as the 10 fetters. 
that is actually producing these disconsent feelings. Namely, it's craving, desire, attachment. And the teachings of the Buddha are designed to be able to help you understand those pollutions and then train your mind with various tools and techniques to uproot them and eliminate them so that then you can experience the peace and the joy. So the teachings of the Buddha, it's not about a bunch of beliefs. And then if you believe these things, then when you die, something good's gonna happen. That's not what he actually did, is he's teaching you about the world around you so that you can understand these natural laws and now you'll navigate the world more readily. You won't struggle and have difficulties anymore. So when you're learning the teachings of the Buddha, you're never interested in believing anything. You'll never see in the original words of the Buddha where he says, believe me or believe me or believe me. He says, come investigate these teachings, examine them. Because if you investigate and examine his teachings and you're not believing them, you'll be able to intellectually learn them. You'll be able to reflect on them to verify whether they're true or they're false. And then you'll be able to practice them. And as you're implementing them and integrating them into your life through practicing the teachings, you'll be able to see that the condition of your mind in your life drastically improves. You'll see that your personal professional relationships really blossom. You'll notice that your mind has more focus, concentration, clarity, and deep memory. You'll notice that you get to the point where you can be polite, kind, friendly, and respectful to everybody around you. You won't even be in a bad mood anymore. Right now, that's probably quite challenging for you. When someone's disrespectful to you, you probably get angry or frustrated or annoyed, or maybe you feel like you would like to be disrespectful back to them, but this doesn't actually solve your problems. So this moral conduct section that the Buddha is going to describe to you through his own words, I'm going to use his words to show you what he taught, and then I'm going to teach it to you and help you understand how to integrate it into your life. You'll be able to learn these teachings. You'll be able to reflect on them to independently verify them, and you'll be able to practice them and see that they actually work. And I'm going to show you how to do that as part of our class. And you've been doing the same thing all throughout your life with something called the natural law of gravity. That when you first had exposure to the natural law of gravity as a young child, an infant, and a toddler, you struggled with this natural law. But slowly but surely, you awoke to that natural law. But when you didn't have the wisdom of this natural law, you fell down, you hit your head, you broke your toys, you had all kinds of difficulties with this natural law. But slowly but surely, you gained wisdom of this natural law. You awoken to the natural law of gravity. And now you make wise decisions. You can climb ladders, you can ride bicycles, you can ride motorbikes, you can get on airplanes and fly all over the world because you understand the natural law of gravity. You don't believe the natural law of gravity, you know that it's true. You've seen it for yourself. And the same thing is true about these teachings, that you need to be able to see the truth for yourself. And as you see that truth and you get to the wisdom, that's what's going to help you awaken and now make wiser decisions about how you interact in the world. So when you're learning right speech, right action, right livelihood, it's based on right view and right intention. Understanding that the feelings that you experience, it's not being caused by somebody else. Being bitter, harsh, and hostile through your speech and your actions isn't going to solve anything. So the Buddha teaches in right intention, among other things, to practice harmlessness. And if you didn't attend this class that I taught last week, it's been recorded, so you could go back and actually see what right view and right intention is because that's the real foundation of everything that you need in order to now build on the moral conduct. When you're learning moral conduct, it's important to understand that the Buddha didn't teach rules and commandments. He's not trying to guilt, shame, or fear you into doing anything at all. His mind's already peaceful. His mind's already calm. He's just helping you to understand what he did in order to get to this enlightened mental state. Essentially, what he's doing is he's exposing you to the natural law of gamma. Some people refer to it as karma. This is a different language. This is the Sanskrit language that people use the word karma. The original teachings of the Buddha are in the Pali language. So the word gamma is what's being used there in the original teachings of the Buddha. If this translated to just one English word, I would just use that word because it'd be much easier for everyone. But this word doesn't translate to just one English word, so I still need to use the word gamma. So this word gamma or the natural law of gamma, what it's referring to is this cause and effect or this action and result that everything that you make decisions about, it's going to produce some type of result in your life. And when you make wise decisions, it's going to produce wholesome results. But when you make unwise decisions, it's going to produce unwholesome results in your life. Typically, when something's happening in our life in the unenlightened state and it's disagreeable to us, we will tend to blame other people. We will look for somebody else to blame for what we're experiencing. Or we might say it's good luck or bad luck. 
or we might say it's it's fate or it's destiny. But in reality, what you're experiencing in your life is based on your decisions. And when you lack wisdom of this natural law of, of karma, you're going to naturally make unwise decisions that's going to produce unwholesome results in your life. Not because you're a bad person, not because you've necessarily done anything wrong. It's just in the unenlightened state, we lack wisdom of this natural law. So we make unwise decisions and it produces unwholesome results. We can think we have all the best intentions in the world. But when we implement a certain decision through our speech, our actions, our livelihood, it can blow up on us because if we don't understand the natural law of gamma, we're not functioning through wisdom. So therefore we're making unwise decisions that produces unwholesome results. So I'm going to teach you this natural law of gamma through the moral conduct. There's other parts of our programs where I actually talk about this natural law itself, but just understand that what I'm going to teach you today is not rules or commandments. It's not any kind of thing like that. It's helping you to understand what's going to lead to wholesome results in your life. By making wise decisions around your speech, your actions, and your livelihood, you'll experience improved results in your life. Because it's your life, it's your decisions, it's your results. The natural law of gamma, it's not mystical and magical. It's not punishments and rewards. There's no being that's overseeing the natural law of gamma. It's not about who's at fault or who's to blame. It's essentially a sequence of events that because there's a certain cause, there's going to be an effect. Or when there's a certain action, there's going to be a certain result. This is cause and effect or action and result. So there's no being that's overseeing the natural law of gamma that's turning it on and turning it off or punishing and rewarding people. That's what the natural law of gravity is. You can see that. There's nobody that turns it on or turns it off. There's no one overseeing it. It's a natural law that's just functioning all the time. And the natural law of gamma is the same way. It's affecting you whether you realize it or not. But when you gain wisdom of this natural law and you fully awake into what this natural law is, now you can navigate the world with the wisdom of this natural law. And slowly but surely, as you gain wisdom of this natural law, you'll improve the condition of your mind in the condition of your life, that you'll see your relationships will significantly improve. That right now, if you have relationships where there's some bitterness and hostility and aggression in your relationships, you can clean all of that up by improving your own mind. It starts with you. Oftentimes people think that the problem is external and we need to fix mom or we need to fix dad or we need to fix brother or sister or somebody else. But in reality, what this practice is doing for you is showing you how to do the work on your own mind because you can't control other people. You can't control what other people do, what they choose to say, what they choose to do and how they choose to function in the world. All you can do is control your own mind. But with a lack of wisdom, you're not going to know how to control your own mind. So here I'm going to teach you the first part, which is right speech. These are the words of the Buddha here. I'm going to read them to you and then I'm going to walk you through and explain to you what they are and how to independently reflect on them that they're true. So here is part of the Eightfold Path. When he talks about right speech, he's explaining to you the way to not cause harm through your speech because any harm that you put out, it's going to come back to you. So here he says, in what monks is right speech? Refraining from lying, refraining from slander, refraining from harsh speech, refraining from frivolous speech. This is called right speech. So what he's sharing with you here is harmful things that you could do with your speech that is going to harm. So therefore harm is going to come back to you. And you can take this and you can understand it and learn what it is and then you can independently reflect on it through your own direct experience and see the truth for yourself. So here the Buddha is saying that it's unwise to lie, right? To tell a deliberate false truth, right? You've lied before. Every single person in this room, every single person in the world has lied. As we've grown up, we lied. Did we experience wholesome results when we lied or did we experience unwholesome results? Of course, we experienced unwholesome results. We lied, somebody found out about our lies, we had difficulties, our relationships uh, were damaged, we have difficulties in our personal, professional life due to the lying, right? So you can see like, yeah, it's very unwise to lie. If you've done a lot of lying, you also know that your mind was probably obsessively trying to figure out what did you say to one person versus what did you say to somebody else? So how would you be able to get to the peace and joyful mental state if your mind is constantly trying to figure out what did I say to this person? What did I say to this person? What did I say to this person? You have to constantly figure that out. But if you can get to a point where you just speak the truth all the time, hey, your mind can be at ease because you're just speaking the truth about what's going on in your life and what's truly happening. You can just speak the truth. You don't need to 
obsessively figure out what did you say to one person versus another. And then you can be trustworthy and dependable in your relationships and in your community. This next one is slander or gossip. This is where you're speaking in damaging ways that would damage the reputation of other people or a, an organization or a company or some population or a country or something like this. If you were to speak in a way that uses slander or gossip, you're causing harm and you're damaging others and this harm will come back to you. You can see that in your own life, if you've ever done any gossiping or slandering, that you see that people are probably gossiping and slandering about you. Whoever you gossip or slander to, not only are you damaging other people, but that those people that you're talking to, where you're slandering and gossiping, when your back's turned, at the very least, they're going to be gossiping and slandering about you because people get used to you doing it. So now when your back is turned, people are going to gossip and slander about you as well. You can look in the news and you can see, I'm not saying the way that this is the way that it should be. I'm just explaining to you the way the world is that you can see that when people gossip and slander in the news, like if a politician stands up on the news and gossips and slanders, wait a couple of days. It's only a matter of time before somebody gets up and gossip and slanders about that person. Or if you look at a situation where there's been maybe an investigative reporter, this is where people might be gossiping or slandering about somebody in the public and this person might end up being murdered or killed, right? The teachings of the Buddha aren't explaining to you the way the world should be. And if everybody follows these rules and commandments, the world's going to experience a certain thing. Instead, he's explaining to you the way the world is. And if you gossip and slander, you're going to see that it's going to come back to you and you're going to experience harm because of that. And then here he talks about harsh speech. This is your tone, your tempo, and your word choice, the way you choose to interact with others. If you've been harsh and aggressive and hostile and bitter, which I'm sure you have in the unenlightened state, that's what we tend to do. You can see that it produces unwholesome results. So the Buddha is helping you to see this natural law of gamma of cause and effect or action and result more clearly. And then this last one here, he's talking about frivolous speech. Sometimes this is referred to as idle chatter. This is just kind of like random chit chat where there's really no purpose behind it. If you or somebody else you've ever been around, it's just been like yada, 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 yada. It's just like random chit chat. And it's just like, it's not really a conversation. It's more like broadcast right? Like you might've been just broadcasting to somebody or somebody might've been broadcasting to you and you're just sitting there for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And you're just like, oh my goodness, what is going on? Like, when is this person going to stop talking, right? Either you were doing that or the other person was doing it, right? This is causing harm and people aren't going to be interested in listening to you. You'd like to have an interesting conversation or a discussion. You would like to create space in the conversation for other people to talk. Whereas if you were just yada, 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 people are going to tune you out, right? You're not going to be very influential in your relationships. So this is the first level of right speech that's in the Eightfold Path. And the Buddha encouraged people to speak in this way because then you'll see for yourself that you're not causing harm to others and you'll see that your relationships will improve. But then there's deeper teachings that the Buddha teaches that connect into the Eightfold Path. And that's what's underneath of this line here. This is a deeper teaching on speech. It's called the Five Factors of Well-Spoken Speech where he's guiding students to speak at the right time, what they say is true, they speak gentle, they speak beneficially, and with a mind of loving kindness. These are five aspects of speech that will really help improve your relationships when you're interacting. And, you know, during the lifetime of the Buddha, this was referred to as right speech, but nowadays we might think about this as right communication right? Because during the lifetime of the Buddha, all they had was speech. But nowadays we have Facebook posts, social media posts, emails, chat, text messages, video calls. We have all kinds of ways of communicating. So you would like to practice this in terms of all your communication. So speaking at the right time or communicating at the right time has three aspects to it. One is you're not interested in interrupting people. If you're jumping in and interrupting people, you don't like that when people interrupt you. So if you were jumping in and interrupting other people, they're not going to like that. And they're going to experience certain painful feelings perhaps, and they're going to push you aside. They're going to be disinterested in talking with you. 
Or the second aspect of this is making sure that your mind is ready to speak. If you're angry, if you're frustrated, if you're annoyed, if you're agitated, that's not the right time to speak because the only thing that's going to come out of your mouth when you talk, it's going to be anger and hostility and bitterness. You've done that before. You know where it ends. It ends in broken relationships and difficulties. So speaking at the right time is making sure your mind is ready to actually speak. You should be calm and peaceful. If your mind isn't in that state, walk away. Walk away. Go calm your mind down. Wait an hour, two hours. Wait a day or two. Maybe wait a week or two. Whatever it is, calm your mind down and then come back and speak at the proper time so that you can have a healthy conversation. And then the third aspect of speaking at the proper time is making sure it's the proper time for the other person that perhaps it's not the right time for them. Maybe they're angry, maybe they're bitter, maybe they're harsh, right? Or say you get a a notice in the mail, maybe you're living with a partner or a roommate and you guys didn't pay your rent and you're gonna be kicked out in three days if you don't pay your rent. Well, when they come home from work, if you jump on them right away, as soon as they come home from work, like, oh my goodness, we didn't pay our rent. We got to pay our rent or we're going to get kicked out. This is the wrong time to be speaking, right? Let them come in, put their bags down, let them get some water, get some food, maybe take off their shoes, rest for a little bit, maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Hey, by the way, um, I have something important to talk to you about. Is this a good time to talk with you? And they might say yes. And then you can talk, right? It's a great proper time to talk. But they might say, no, I had a really hard day today. Um, Can we talk about this tomorrow? Well, if you don't have craving, desire, attachment, you should be able to wait until tomorrow, right? It's it's a three-day notice. You're not going to be able to fix the problem tonight anyway. Why not just wait, right? Wait until their mind's ready. Wait until your mind's ready. Then you guys can have a great conversation and it'll produce wholesome results for yourself. So this first aspect of proper speech or the five factors of well-spoken speech, the Buddha is teaching you about the natural law of gamma, of cause and effect or action and result. That is wise to speak at the proper time. That if you're not speaking at the proper time and your mind isn't prepared to talk, their mind isn't prepared to talk, or you're interrupting people, it's not gonna produce a wholesome conversation. You're not gonna have wholesome results in your life. The next one is speaking the truth. This is covered in the the top part of the right speech, that you would like to be a truth speaker, one to be relied on, dependable, right? If you're telling lies, people are going to discover those lies and they're going to find you to be uh, undependable, right? And now your personal and professional relationships are going to struggle because they're going to discover your lies. And then you're going to have to be kind of constantly figuring out what did you say to one person versus what did you say to another person? And this is going to be very difficult to keep your lies straight and you're not going to be able to get to peace and joy in your mind. So speaking the truth will make it easy for you because you just always speak the truth. And then the third one is speaking gentle. This is your tone, your tempo, and your word choice. You would like to pay attention to that. Your tone, your tempo, and your word choice. No matter what language you're speaking, whether it's English or Chinese or Thai or Spanish or French or whatever language you're speaking, pay attention to your tone, your tempo, and your word choice. Here in Thailand, we have various ways to speak. If you notice, the Thai people speak pretty gently. We even have words to show that we're being very polite. At the end of each sentence, you might have heard the word cop or ka, right? Females will say ka, sawadi ka, sawadi ka, kap kun ka, right? The males will say kap kun kap, kap kun kap, or sawadi kap. This is showing politeness and kindness and respect ensuring that people know like, hey, I'm talking respectfully with you. Not every language has that word, right? But in English language and other languages, we can talk with our tone, our tempo, and our word choice being very polite, very warm, very friendly, very kind. And it's going to take you some time to develop your mind to do that. In certain relationships, you could probably do that with no problem. But in other relationships, you might be having a lot of difficulties maybe with your parents, maybe with your brothers and sisters, your life partner, your children. This is because you have craving, desire, attachment in your mind. You want this relationship to be a certain way. You're longing, you're yearning, you're wanting mom and dad to be a certain way, or brothers and sisters, or your children. You're wanting them to be a certain way. And when they're that way, you're happy. And when they're not that way, you're angry and you're frustrated. And it's harder for you to speak gently in those situations. But if you're aggressive and hostile and bitter in those relationships, that's what's going to come back to you. Oftentimes we think the way to improve our relationships is to fix those people. 
But the way that you actually solve your relationships and sort out your life is you got to work on your own mind first. And when you become loving and kind and more gentle in the way that you speak, as you do that over months, over months, over months, you'll notice that your relationships really improve. When I grew up, I was pretty bitter and hostile and harsh. That's what I learned growing up. And I had a lot of those kinds of relationships around me and I needed to improve that. But the way to improve it is you work on your own mind first. Right? So as you do the work to train your own mind through all the teachings of the Buddha, not just this, but through all the teachings, you'll be able to gradually improve your relationships. So it's not just the moral conduct that the Buddha teaches. Next week, I'm going to be teaching the mental discipline, which helps you to learn how to train your mind so that you can actually do this. This fourth one that the Buddha is talking about here is speaking beneficially. This is ensuring that when you speak, you speak purposefully. Right? You're not interested in just yada, 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 purposeful speech where there's a purpose behind it. And sometimes when you talk with people, yeah, you're chit chatting like, hey, how's your day going? Or what have you been doing? Oh, you went on travel. You know, what did you do when you were traveling? This is purposeful. This is beneficial. This is helping you to build relationships. Right. So speaking beneficially doesn't always necessarily mean that it's the topic that you're talking about. There's not like an approved list of topics to talk about. You talk about whatever you'd like to talk about. But just be sure you're speaking purposefully, right? That it's beneficial to you and to other people when you're speaking, that it's not unbeneficial. And then the fifth one here is with a mind of loving kindness. What loving kindness is, is a genuine interest in seeing all beings be well, active goodwill. If you speak with a mind of, or that is opposite of a mind of loving kindness, this would be with inner hate or anger. If you spoke with inner hate or anger, which you've done before, we all have done that, you see the results that it's produced, right? So the Buddha is giving you this guidance. He's not telling you the way your personality should be or your character should be. That's you, right? That's all the way that you choose to be. But he's giving you this guidance on the natural law that he's helping you to see how to speak in ways that produces wholesome results. Okay, so this is a little bit of the intellectual learning here. But now you don't believe anything that a teacher teaches you about the teachings of the Buddha. You're not believing these teachings. You're learning them intellectually. You're investigating them. So we've just done a little bit of that. And we've also started to do a little bit of reflection where I've kind of encouraged you to think about certain things in your life. But now that you're starting to understand the five factors of well-spoken speech, think about situations where your conversation did not go well. It could have been this morning, it could have been yesterday, it could have been last week or a month ago where you had a, a very bad conversation, a conversation that produced unwholesome results. Look at that conversation and contrast it with these five factors of well-spoken speech. Either you and or the other person wasn't speaking at the right time. Either your mind was agitated or angry or they were or you were interrupting them or you weren't speaking the truth or they weren't speaking the truth or you or the other person wasn't speaking gentle, you weren't speaking beneficially, or you weren't speaking with a mind of loving kindness. You can see the truth for yourself that in those situations, the conversation didn't go well. It turned out in an unwholesome way because you and or the other person wasn't using these five factors of well-spoken speech. But then also go a step further. Look at situations where you did have great conversations, where it did produce wholesome results, and it turned out really well. And you didn't necessarily know these five factors of well-spoken speech there, and neither did the other person, but you guys were actually practicing them without actually realizing it. And there you can see that your conversation went really well. But now what you do on the path to enlightenment to start integrating it into your practice, because if you've learned it and you start reflecting on it, now you start integrating it into your practice. And now as you start practicing this consciously, where in the past, you didn't know what these five factors were, so you weren't necessarily practicing them in all situations. But now, if you can consciously understand these and consciously start dialing them into your life closer and closer, you'll see improvements to the condition of your life and the condition of your mind. But it's going to be challenging for you, particularly in those relationships where you have craving, desires, attachments. You're not going to be able to just go outside and snap your fingers and instantly do this. This is where the meditation and all the other training comes in to be able to train your 
your mind to eradicate the pollution so that you can then implement these types of teachings. But you need to know these teachings in order to implement them. You're not going to be able to do this perfectly with every single person in your life the first time you learn about it. So you're gradually training your mind, you're gradually practicing, and you're gradually experiencing progress. Essentially, what we're getting to here with the five factors of well-spoken speech is establishing something that is referred to in the Thai language as barami. This is a Thai word. It's called barami. What barami is, is this is, means the one who people listen to. If you have barami, you're the one who people listen to. In each village in Thailand, there's kind of some village elders that people know these people are very successful. And if you have any issues, you can go to them and go talk to them and they'll help you and give you advice to improve your life and suggestions. And when I say they're very successful, I don't mean financially successful. What I mean is they're very successful in their relationships, that they're very harmonious in their relationships and they have very good relationships in the community. So people know that they're very successful in their relationships and they have this harmonious relationships. So you can go to them and talk to them and get help and villagers will tend to go to these people and ask for help. They have barami. They're the ones who people listen to. And the way you establish barami in a community is by practicing where you're speaking in ways that isn't causing harm to other people. Because if you're speaking in ways that's harmful to your neighbors, to your coworkers, to your friends and family, people won't be interested in spending time with you. But if you can speak in ways where you're not causing harm, more and more people will be interested in spending time with you and more and more people will see you as being influential and you'll be able to be helpful in your community. So right now, whatever community you're in, whether it's in France or if it's in Brazil or whether it's in uh, Mexico or Australia or Japan, no matter where you live, you can practice these natural laws. You can practice the five factors of well-spoken speech and gradually dial this into your life and you'll be able to see that the condition of your mind and your life drastically improves because as long as you're being bitter, harsh, and hostile in the way that you interact with people, this is just going to come back to you. So you would like to improve this. And not only the way that you communicate through your spoken words, but as I mentioned on social media and things like this, because you could go into a job interview and you could do really, really well in the job interview. And those people could be very enthused with the interview that you've done. But if when you go home, they check out your social media and they see you're aggressive and hostile and bitter, you may not get the job. Right? So you would like all your communication, whether it's text messages, emails, whether it's social media, all that stuff to be practicing the five factors of well-spoken speech. So if you're really angry, that's the wrong time to be sending a chat message. Right? If you're sending a chat message, it's going to be anger, bitterness, harsh, hostile. Right? And that's what's going to come back to you. So put that on pause. Right? Walk away from it. So this is right speech. And the Buddha is guiding you to understand these natural laws so that you can then implement it into your life. Okay, so something that you can read in the book, if you go to volume one, chapter five, is I talk about right speech in detail. I talk about each individual factor because you're going to need to remind yourself of this. You're not going to be able to just learn it once and implement it 100 percent. Essentially, what I get to is I talk about polite, kind, friendly, and respectful speech because the five factors of well-spoken speech is exactly what you need in order to improve your relationships. But if for some reason, if you can't remember that and you're kind of in a tight situation, if you can remember to speak polite, kind, friendly, and respectful, this will really help you. But ultimately, you would like to dial in those five factors of well-spoken speech very closely. So let me pause here and see if you guys have any questions about right speech before I move on to talk about right action. If you guys have any questions, here at the temple we have microphones in that white bowl. If you just press the gray button, the lights will come on. You just wait a second or two and then hold it up to your chin. We'll be able to hear you here at the temple and they'll be able to hear you online too because we're live streaming and there's people online as well. And then for those of you guys in Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, if you would like to ask a question, you can put it into the comment section and I'll be able to see that and answer your question. And then for those of you guys in Zoom, you can even electronically raise your hand and then you can open up your microphone and then we'll be able to hear you here at the temple and you can just speak and they'll be able to hear you on the live stream as well. So is there anybody here? Is there anybody online that would like to ask a question about right speech or right communication? Oh, okay. Looks like we have a question here. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Vibhav? 
Right, David, uh, I guess my question on right speech is that in some situations you need to be firm. Um, also, then how do you have rights, like how do you be respectful and gentle and kind and be firm at the same time because you need to give something back in a way that is uh, as a firm feedback. Yeah, I, I think what you're saying is in some situations you feel like you have to be firm. Is that what you're saying? When you're giving, especially in like uh, when you are giving feedback to your team members or your, you know, in business situations, sometimes you have to be firm in your your feedback so that people not think it's. it's sometimes it's if you are like I guess <laughs> in experience if you're too gentle or too kind in your speech. People don't don't respect that, and they don't they don't take it seriously. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, and so sometimes you have to speak in a way that's a little bit more formal that they understand the gravity of what you're trying to say, so that they actually implement it. I was in a meeting in the other day, and they said you were like too kind the way that you you spoke. So I want to know how how to be firm and is the five like the five factor speech at the same time. Thank you. Yeah, I don't suggest that you speak that way with people. Uh, that's what you're doing now, perhaps, and that's what you're thinking now, but it doesn't work. You might think that in your mind, you want this person to do a certain thing. And if I speak firm with them, then they will do what I want. But what you're doing on the Eightfold Path is you're eliminating those cravings, those desires, those wants. That's what's driving you and motivating you to produce the unwholesome results in your life. You would like to impart wisdom and guidance and advice so that the person is choosing to do these things on their own. Because if you keep having to be firm and firm and firm and firm, it's not working. Otherwise, you wouldn't have to be firm. What you would like to do is impart wisdom and guidance and advice so that the person sees that the guidance that you're providing is helpful and beneficial. And now they choose on their own to do those things. Whether your back is turned or not, they will naturally choose to do those things. If you're having to speak firmly in order to convince people that what you're asking them to do is what you want them to do, then they're not making that choice on their own. So that means every single time you turn your back, they're not gonna make the decision in the way that you want them to make the decision. So instead, what you'd like to do is calmly, patiently, and gently sit down with them, help them understand the wisdom behind why it is that you're asking them to do things in a certain way, and then help them to be able to see why that's wise, and then, once they have that wisdom on board, then they will naturally make those decisions themselves, whether you're there or whether you're away, because they see the wisdom in what it is that you're explaining to them. But with your mind having craving, yeah, you're gonna wanna speak firm with them because you're gonna want them to do things your way, but you're not going to experience the peace and the joy. You're not gonna be able to experience harmonious relationships and be at ease in your relationships by speaking firm with people. That's not gonna actually work, and that's what you might be doing now, but you're gonna to need to be able to see the wisdom in this that you can transition to speaking gentle. But it's gonna take patience on your side. It's gonna take training of your mind. It's gonna te it's gonna take you speaking speaking in a more intellectual way where you can sit down and have conversations with each other and you can have discussions with each other and you can contribute your ideas, they can contribute their ideas and now mutually you guys come to a conclusion of what would be wise in any given situation. This isn't typical the way that things might be done around you right now. You might see people speaking firm and trying to force people or control people to do things a certain way but you can learn this better way of life and as you implement it, you'll be able to see that it works. Okay, it looks like we have a question coming in here on YouTube. Hello, I'm interested in these teachings in class from the beginning. Okay, great. Yeah, you can look at our, our YouTube channel. We have a playlist called uh, the Group Learning Program, and uh, on there you'll see all the classes from the very beginning of the Group Learning Program, and you can watch them. So feel free to, to look at our YouTube channel, because I see you're on YouTube right now. Let's see if we have any questions on Facebook. Um, I have a question. Oh, where are we? Right oh, yeah, yes, sir. So. I, I guess it just appears to me that the right speech is not actually just the technique of speaking, but it's actually training your mind how to speak the right way. 
Yes. There's a mental discipline section yeah. to this eightfold path that you need the meditation yeah. in order to reduce the pollution of your mind so that you're then able to practice right speech. Because right now, understanding it intellectually, okay, you understand it to a certain degree, but going out in the world and actually practicing it would be very challenging for you because right now your mind has certain pollutions. So that's why the next section, next Sunday, there's the mental discipline section that's going to help you to understand how to eliminate the pollutions of your mind so that you can implement something like right speech. I guess my question is in uh, a broader sense, mm -hmm. I think everybody's different, but what is the ultimate purpose? The ultimate purpose of right speech? Yes. Of this would help you to stop causing harm through your speech so that then you won't experience harm coming back to you through through people's speech. And by you functioning through right speech, you'll find your relationships will be more harmonious and you'll be able to navigate the world more readily. At one time in my life, I was bitter and harsh and hostile and I was experiencing a lot of bitterness, harshness and hostility coming back to me. Now I choose not to do that. And there's no relationships in my life that have any kind of bitterness or hostility. I don't argue with anybody. And because of that, nobody ever argues with me. I'm not bitter and harsh and hostile with anybody. And because of that, people aren't bitter, harsh, and hostile with me either. All my relationships are at ease, and it's through these teachings that you'll be able to be able to experience that. But as long as you're speaking without this guidance, you're going to experience bitterness and hostility and harshness coming back to you. Yep. So if you're interested in getting to a peaceful and joyful mind and a peaceful and joyful life, this is the way to do that through your moral conduct. But you need other training as well. This is just one section of what's going to ultimately lead to your peace and joy of your mind and in your life. Mm -hmm. Okay, looks like we have something coming in here on Zoom through the comment section. Uh, I'm going to need to look at that. My site isn't so great. Let's see. How about the th thing people think and speak is not the truth, but people don't know? From their side, it's not slander, misunderstanding. They speak the truth. How can we know what is the truth? Okay, so the way that you get to the truth is that you look for independently verifiable evidence, right? So if I, for example, I have a son who's 11 years old. If I said, hey, Bailan, would you mind putting away the clothes? Like this actually happened this morning uh, on our way to the temple. He needed to take a shower and I, and I looked into his room and he wasn't there. He was downstairs and I noticed that there was a whole bunch of clothes uh, piled up in his room that he hadn't put in away in his closet. And I said, hey, Bailan, you need to come upstairs and uh, take a shower. Or actually, I think I said, hey, Bailan, have you taken a shower? And he said, no, I haven't. And I said, oh, well, that's something you're going to need to do because we're going to be leaving soon. And he said, okay, um, you know, I'll come up and take a shower. So then I said, after you take your shower, I noticed you have some clothes in your room. It would be good if you put those away. And he said, okay. So then I took my shower. His shower is really quick. Mine's a little bit longer. I got a bigger body to clean, right? He goes downstairs. I'm done with my shower and uh, I'm getting ready to leave and walk downstairs. And I was like, you know what? Let me check his room. I bet he didn't put those clothes away. And I checked his room and he hadn't put his clothes away. So I said to him, I said, hey, Bailan, um, I noticed that you haven't put the clothes away. What is your plan with that? And he's like, oh, I'm going to come put them away. And I said, okay, sounds good, right? So we came upstairs and he put them away. So I didn't just uh, believe him. I needed to verify, right? I needed to verify that he, that he actually put the clothes away. So you would like independently verifiable evidence. It's not that you should ever be distrusting, but you need to use discernment, which is wise decision making. So you need to check in on things. And in order to get to the truth, you need to independently verify the truth. And based on how you worded your, your, your question, I would like to just be sure that you understand that this practice is about you improving your mind. Even though other people might lie, even though other people might slander, even though other people you know, might have harsh speech, they might have frivolous speech, they might speak at the wrong time, what they say is untrue, they speak uh, you know, harsh, they speak unbeneficially, and they speak with a mind of inner hate. Even though other people are choosing to speak that way, you're going to need to get to the point where you're not doing those things. 
right? Because the world is very murky. It's very muddy, right? And you're trying to rise above that. And if you conform to what other people are doing, you're just going to stay in the darkness with everybody else. So other people are going to be speaking untimely. Other people are going to be speaking falsehoods and, and untruths. Other people are going to be speaking harshly. Other people are going to be speaking unbeneficially. Other people are going to be speaking with a mind of inner hate. But what you would like to do is speak with the five factors of well-spoken speech. Even though you see other people speaking in unwise ways, they're experiencing the results of that. Just like you're experiencing the results of having spoken in unwise ways in the past. This is why some of your relationships are challenged. But if you can gradually transition over to this, this is what you'll see will improve the condition of your mind and your life. So I encourage you not to conform to what other people are doing, but be able to see the truth in this and then gradually implement it in your life. And that's where you'll see the real improvement and the real benefits. Yes, sir. Just to uh, follow up on the person's question online, there's a lot of falsehood out there. Mm -hmm. And lots of times it's not easy or even, I would say, possible to immediately know what is true. So, in fact, some of the things you've been told all your life, you find out later are not true at all, never were true. And that might take, you know, decades to find that out. So, I mean, in some cases, the truth is readily apparent and you can on your own. But in other cases, you may never know you may suspect that that's not true. As time goes by, you may learn it's not true. But sometimes the truth is very difficult to get at. Mm -hmm. So if you could comment on that. Yeah, so what you learn very well on this path is you learn how to get to the truth because the body of wisdom that the Buddha shared is extensive, right? And you're gonna to need to be able to learn his teachings, reflect on them to independently verify them and practice them. And you're gonna to need to do that readily as you make your way to enlightenment. So you get very good at hear somebody who said something 2,500 years ago, and is this the truth? And that's what you get really good at. And then you get really good at that in your personal life too, because if you're doing that with the teachings of the Buddha, you learn how to do that in your personal life. If if there's anything impactful that somebody tells you and you know it's going to impact your life, don't wait decades to figure out whether it's true or not. You can take your time to figure that out now and you just need to learn how to be able to do that. If you have certain situations that you'd like to share with me, I can help you to understand how to do that. But if there's something that you're about to make a decision on that's going to be impactful for your life or the people around you, you would like to make sure you're operating on 100% the truth and that you're not making decisions based on lies. And in order to do that, you're going to need to understand like, okay, is this the truth or not? And if you don't know whether it's the truth, you're going to need to actively seek that out and not wait decades to be able to determine whether something is the truth or not. Do you have a certain situation that you would like to share? No? Okay. All right. Okay. So let me see here. All right, you're welcome, pleased to help you. All right, so let's go on to the next step, which is right action. Here, what the Buddha is providing is guidance on three uh, bodily actions that are harmful. So I'm gonna read this to you and then I'll teach you what this step is, or this factor. He says, in what monks is right action? Refraining from taking life, refraining from taking what is not given, refraining from sexual misconduct. This is called right action. So what he's talking about here is harmful bodily actions. And he's talking about three significant ones or important ones to keep, a, keep an eye on, killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct. But what he's teaching as part of right action is any kind of harm you cause through your bodily action, that harm is going to come back to you. He's not giving you a complete exhaustive list of every single harm that you could potentially create through your bodily actions because that would be an endless list. He doesn't say, you know, don't walk through the aisle of an airplane and drag your suitcase and 
run over people's feet and knock them into the, you know, knock their knees with your suitcase because planes didn't exist during his lifetime, right? But if you understand this particular step and what he's talking about in this factor of the Eightfold Path is he's encouraging you not to cause harm through your bodily action because when you're causing harm through your bodily action, that harm is going to come back to you. And if you or somebody you ever have observed has walked through the aisle of an airplane, dragging their suitcase, running over people's feet and hitting into the knees, you probably saw the reaction, right? People got bitter and harsh and hostile. At the very least, they got a lot of harsh looks from people, right? So you would like to conduct yourself in such a way that you're not causing any harm through your bodily actions. That's what this step is all about. And the Buddha is giving you three significant ones that can cause significant harm. But you're going to need to have the insight and the wisdom to apply this in all aspects of your life, that you're not causing any harm through your bodily actions. So notice he doesn't say, don't walk up to someone and punch them in the face, right? He doesn't say that. But if you understand what this step is, then you would know that that's unwise. Because if you punch somebody in the face, they're probably going to punch you back. They might pull out a gun or a knife. Their friends or their family might attack you if there's people around. It would be very unwise to cause harm with your bodily actions by punching someone in the face. So he's not giving you an exhaustive list here. But if you understand this factor, then you would understand not to cause bodily harm through your your body, right? And in a situation where you're walking down the street and you occasionally bump into somebody by accident, apologize, right? You apologize to that person. Something I would like to point out here is with this sexual misconduct, sometimes people ask questions about that. They're like, hey, what is sexual misconduct? Well, it's in the five precepts that the Buddha uh, teaches the sexual misconduct. And the five precepts is something that I teach in chapter seven of this particular book series and of this particular program. We're going to be discussing the five precepts and going into detail using the words of the Buddha. But I would like to just give you a heads up because that's several weeks from now in this particular program that we're going to be discussing the five precepts is that the Buddha doesn't teach that same gender relationships are harmful or sexual misconduct. Sometimes people think that that would include same gender relationships, but this isn't true because what the Buddha is teaching you in sexual misconduct when he describes it is he talks about harmful sexual misconduct, conduct that's going to cause harm to others, like sex with minors, like sex without consent, or sex going outside of an existing relationship that you're in, or luring somebody out of their relationship in order to have sex. In these situations, you're causing harm to other people. But when he talks about uh, sexual misconduct, he never discusses same gender relationships. But he was well aware of same gender relationships because he talks about it in his teachings. It's been going on since the very beginning of time. If you understand the universal truth of impermanence, meaning that there's nothing that's permanent in this material world, then you understand that it's not possible for every man to be interested in having sex with a female. And it's not possible for every female to be interested in having sex with a male. It's just not possible. It's never happened since the beginning of time that there's going to be some males who are interested in having sex with females, but there's going to be some males who are interested in having sex with males. And the same thing with females, that there's going to be some females who aren't interested in having sex with males. They're interested in having sex with females. This is completely normal. If every male or every female was interested in having sex with the opposite gender, this would be permanence. That means that this is a permanent thing that every single person in the world wants to have sex with the opposite gender. This isn't actually ever going to occur. It never has occurred. Look around the world around you. You can see that there's nothing that's permanent. Everything's constantly changing. So the Buddha never taught that same gender relationships are harmful because if you have two loving, consenting adults that are choosing to have sexual relationship with each other, they haven't caused harm to anybody. They haven't caused harm to anybody at all. They're two loyal, loving, consenting adults choosing to have sex with each other. Whether that's a male and a female or a male male and a female female, it's the same exact thing. They're not causing harm to anybody. So when we get to the five precepts, you'll be able to see in more detail about what the Buddha taught about sexual misconduct. But I just give you that heads up because that's probably a good two months away from now before we actually study the five precepts in this particular program. So there's other things that the Buddha did teach about action that would cause harm. Of course, killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, but he also teaches about substances that cause heedlessness, that if you take substances like 
alcohols or drugs or substances that are causing heedlessness, which is a lack of attention or a lack of alertness or a lack of awareness of mind, this is causing harm to you. It's causing harm to this body, who you are. So if you go out into the world intoxicated or uh, if you're experiencing those kinds of things based on the choices that you're making to put substances into your body, this is going to produce unwholesome results in your life. So that's one of the bodily actions that he talks about. And then he also talks about gambling as well, where if you're gambling, you're wanting more money and you're gambling and you're having craving, desire, attachment. And when you're doing that, you're most likely not going to have the funds that you need for your basic necessities. If you gambled in excess, you're going to notice that you're going to potentially not have the ability to buy food and water and clothing and shelter and medical care, the things that you need to sustain your life. So he's helping you to see that by you gambling, it's a bodily action that is causing you harm. So he has a couple of other bodily actions that he talks about. But if you understand this step of right action, it's ensuring that you're not causing any harm through your bodily actions. And this is like where you guys are sitting. You guys are all sitting very politely, very respectfully. You're, you're not bumping into each other. You're not, when you're walking through a space, you're not just haphazardly walking through the space, right? You're making sure that you're not bumping into somebody. That's part of right action. So you can apply this step to all aspects of your life, whether you're in an airplane walking down the aisle, whether you're in a public space or wherever you're at, you're always interested ensuring you're not causing harm through your bodily actions. So do you guys have any questions on this step? Either here at the temple or online. Remember, those of you guys online, if you put your questions into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, I'll be able to see that. And then for those of you guys in Zoom, you can also electronically raise your hand and ask any questions that you like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can keep the mic with you, by the way. We have plenty of them. Can you explain more about uh, taken was not given? Sure. What this would be, this would be like stealing. So if I like stole somebody's car, I'm causing that person harm because now they can't go grocery shopping. They can't take their kids to school. They can't go to work and make money, right? They can't collect the basic necessities that they need to sustain life. I've caused harm to this person. And now people are going to be interested in causing harm to me. This is why uh, in some places, you know, you're going to go to jail. Maybe if somebody sees you driving that car, you're going to get beat up. You can get murdered. Uh, people can steal things from you. Uh, you can have all kinds of harms that come to you as a result of that. So the Buddha is teaching you and guiding you how to not cause harm to others. And when you see the five precepts, if you decide to study that with me through the words of the Buddha, he goes into more detail about this, but that's just a little bit of detail to help you get started. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions. So now let's talk about right livelihood. What right livelihood is, is this is all about how you choose to sustain your life, right? Like if you're choosing to sustain your life off of causing harm to others, then this harm is going to come back to you. So the Buddha is guiding you to select a livelihood and how you choose to sustain your life through like an income in your daily activity in a way that doesn't cause harm to others. So here in the Eightfold Path, he's just speaking very generally. He says, in what monks is right livelihood? Here monks, a noble disciple, having given up wrong livelihood, keeps himself by right livelihood. Okay, so this is very general, but what he teaches in other parts of his teachings is what this is, because the Eightfold Path is a core central teaching that integrates a whole bunch of other teachings. So when you go look at his other teachings, he has other teachings on right livelihood, and this is the first fold of purification that I'm going to teach you. There's two aspects of purification for right livelihood. The first part is this one, where you learn about having business and weapons, living beings, meat, substances that cause heedlessness and poisons would be causing harm to others. So if you're sustaining your life where you're working at a job that is causing harm to others, this harm is going to come back to you. And the Buddha is saying it would be unwise for you to cause harm to others through your livelihood because that harm is just going to come back to you. That instead, find a livelihood that's going to be wholesome and not cause harm. So these are five individual livelihoods that the Buddha says it would be unwise for us to engage in. Now again, you're not interested in believing this. You don't believe any of the teachings of the Buddha. You take these and you independently reflect on them and you start looking at direct experiences that either you've had or you've seen other people have. So let's just take one of these. 
business and substances that cause heedlessness. If I stood on the street corner and I sold crystal methamphetamine or heroin or cocaine or something like this into my community, I'm causing harm into the community. The community is becoming addicted to this substance. And now they're going out stealing and robbing and doing all kinds of other harmful things in the community in order to give me that money. And now as a result, me standing on the street corner, I'm very easily to get beat up, very easy to get robbed, easy to get murdered, easy to have difficulties in my life. I can get arrested. I can even get addicted to the substance myself, right? This is the result of my decisions that I've chosen to sustain my life off of causing harm in the community. So now harm is coming back to me through people being interested to beat me up and murder me, arrest me, uh, rob from me, steal from me. This is all the results of my decisions. But remember, this is the natural law of gamma. This is happening and functioning at all times, whether you're aware of it or not. It's not just illegal substances like crystal methamphetamine, cocaine, heroin, things like this. This is related to other substances too. If I were to take a job at a liquor store, for example, or at a bar or something like this, it's very likely that I could experience difficulties there too. So legally, my government might say, hey, you can go be a cashier at a liquor store. You're not going to get arrested. We're not going to do anything. But remember, this isn't a human law. This is the natural law of gamma. This is a natural law that is functioning at all times, whether you're aware of it or not. If I went and became a cashier at a liquor store, this liquor store is very likely to get robbed, which means someone's going to come in with a gun or a knife or something, and, and I'm going to experience the, that particular thing. Or someone might come in and beat me up and murder me. People have been murdered in these situations. At the very least, you're going to be dealing with clientele that are intoxicated in some situations. You're going to need to deal with that. So the Buddha is showing you this natural law of gamma that it would be unwise to take this job as a person working at a liquor store. So if you just follow the laws of your government, you might be actually following something that the government is not going to arrest you for being a cashier at that liquor store. But if you understand the natural law of gamma, you can ask yourself, would it be wise for you to work at this liquor store? And this is what you need to look at and decide for yourself. The Buddha is not telling you what you should or shouldn't do. He's just giving you the wisdom of how to produce wholesome results in your life by making wise decisions. So here you could go through each one of these five and you would be able to see how they're causing harm in the world and how this harm is going to come back to you. And then the Buddha shares another aspect of this first fold of purification with your livelihood. This is about how you conduct your livelihood. He talks about scheming, flattering, hinting, belittling, or pursuing gain with gain. What scheming is, is that if you were say a doctor or you are a politician. It's not one of those five that we just talked about. It's not business and weapons, business and living beings, business and meat, business and substances that cause heedlessness, or business and poisons. I could be a politician and it's not causing harm to anybody in the world. But let's just say I'm corrupt and I'm scheming, right? Maybe 10 years into my career, 15 years into my career, people find out that I've been corrupt and now I don't get reelected. My career has just come to a crashing halt because people don't reelect me as a politician. So if you're scheming in your career or in your livelihood, it's going to come back to cause harm to you. This next one is flattery. This is where you have like insincere comments where you're just kind of saying things to people in order to get them to kind of buy things from you, like your customers. Whereas if you have a customer come in and you just kind of like, oh, your hair's so beautiful. Wow, that jewelry looks really nice on you. Hey, would you like to buy some of these things over here? People are going to see through that, right? And over time, as you function that way, less and less people are going to be interested in doing business with you because people do business with people. They don't do business with businesses, right? People do business with people. And if they relate to you as a human being and they can see that you're being honest and sincere in the way that you interact with them, they're going to be more interested in interacting with you and doing business with you and giving you money for the products and services that you sell. But if you're insincere and you're flattering people, they're going to see through that. And then you're going to struggle in terms of being able to sustain your life. What hinting is, is hinting is, not being clear and direct in your work. So if you're like on a project team, for example, and now you need to go 
give a presentation to the boss and explain to them what it is that you've been doing over the last several weeks. Well, if you go in there and you're not clear and you're not direct and you're just kind of hinting around, this isn't actually going to be helpful in your career. You would like to be very clear and very concise and very direct about your communication and your job and your occupation, not just hinting around. The next one is belittling. Belittling is where you're degrading or diminishing or disparaging your coworkers, your business partners, maybe your competition, right? Maybe you're degrading your competition and belittling them, trying to make it look like you're so great and everybody else is no good, right? And if you're belittling your competition, people are going to be able to see through that, right? And they're not going to be interested in doing business with you. So the Buddha teaches you to not belittle people. And if you're belittling your coworkers or people like that, you're diminishing them and talking down to them and degrading them, it's going to damage your relationships and you're going to find that your professional relationships struggle. And then this last one, pursuing gain with gain, what this is about is that if you took a job just for the paycheck and just for the money and that's all you cared about, or if you were just selling a product or service just for the money, that's all you cared about, you're going to feel miserable in this job. It's going to feel very boring. It's going to feel very mundane. You're going to feel, you know, uh, very unmotivated and unenthused to go to work each day because all you're doing is going there for the money. And eventually that money is going to wear out right? The craving for that's going to wear out. And eventually you're going to feel very bored, very lonely, very mundane, very unenthused. So if you have a job that you thoroughly enjoy, if you're doing work that you thoroughly enjoy, you can wake up each morning with enthusiasm, right? We call it work. And it's kind of like a four letter word, right? Work. Who wants to work? Nobody wants to work right? Let's not go to work. Let's go do something that we enjoy. Let's go do something that we're enthused about. Let's go do something that we have motivation for, right? So you can actually select a livelihood that you thoroughly enjoy. And when you go to work each day, you're motivated and you're enthused and you enjoy the work that you're doing. But if you've selected a livelihood that you're just pursuing gain with gain, you're just trying to make money and that's your only goal, you're not going to feel very enthused and very motivated about going to work each day. So if you've ever been in that kind of job, it can feel very mundane. It can feel very lonely. You can feel very bored in that situation. So the Buddha is encouraging you that if you would like to create this peaceful and joyful mind, as well as a peaceful and joyful life is to select a livelihood where you're not causing harm to others. And you're also doing something that you have enthusiasm about and motivation for. All right, so this is right livelihood, and this is the first fold of purification and how you can get to a point where you thoroughly enjoy the work that you're doing. By the time that you get to a right livelihood, it won't even feel like work anymore. Each day when you go to whatever it is that you're doing, you'll just thoroughly enjoy what you're doing. Right. When I come here to the temple, there's been times where I've been on my motorbike and it's pouring down raining and I don't have a jacket. I don't have anything. I'm getting soaked and drenched and I'm on the motorbike with a big old smile because I know I'm coming to a place where I'm going to be sharing teachings with people where you can get to this peace and this joy and this calmness and serenity. And if you learn and practice the teachings, you'll actually be able to see how it improves the condition of your mind and the condition of your life. But if you don't learn and you don't practice, you won't experience that. But I'm thoroughly enjoy coming here to share these teachings with people. I do it because I enjoy it, not because anybody's forced me to do it, not because anybody's controlling me to to come here, uh, not because I want your money or I want anything from you. It's because I thoroughly enjoy sharing teachings that I know are going to absolutely lead to your peace and your joy in your life. So you can get to a livelihood where you thoroughly enjoy that work that you're doing. Right At different times in my life, I had jobs where they were very mundane, they were very boring, and I was only going there for the money, right? And that was it. It was a lot of money, and that's what I would do in the past. But gosh, I had to drag myself to work every single day for that period of time. So when you select a livelihood that you thoroughly enjoy, you're going to feel better about your life. It's going to feel like you get to the point where it doesn't even feel like work anymore. You would like to select a livelihood that even if you didn't get paid to do that, you would still do it. You enjoy it that much. Of course, you're going to need to collect a paycheck. You're going to need to collect money in order to provide for your food, clothing, shelter, medical care, and things like this. But you would like to select a livelihood that you enjoy it so much that even if you didn't get paid, 
you would still do that because that's how much you thoroughly enjoy that particular work. So it's going to take you some time to figure that out and figure out what that livelihood is. It doesn't necessarily come natural in your life, but if you can kind of look in your mind and see what you're really motivated and encouraged about, you can get to a point where you thoroughly enjoy the work that you're doing and it doesn't even feel like work anymore. Okay, so any questions on right livelihood? Looks like we have some questions coming in on Zoom. Okay, here we go. We have somebody asking, how about your parents engaging one of the five businesses we cannot choose our family and better respect their life yeah so this practice isn't about what other people are choosing to do this is about your choices and your decisions so if your family is choosing to work in a livelihood that is uh being described here that's their choices and they're experiencing the results of that now, if you have a life partner that's choosing to do one of these livelihoods, you're gonna be impacted by that because you're choosing a life partner who's selling drugs, for example, just using that one, right? You would be impacted by that, but that's because of your choice, the choice that you're making. So you can choose differently, right? You get to choose the type of relationships that you're in and the people that you interact with. So this whole practice, this whole path is about you cultivating wisdom and you making wise decisions that's gonna to lead to the results that are gonna be beneficial for you. So with this type of wisdom, you'll then be able to make wiser decisions that are going to then produce more wholesome results in your life. Without this wisdom, yeah, you might select a, a life partner, you might select a boss, you might select coworkers that are doing these kinds of things. But if you understand the natural law of gamma of cause and effect or action and result, you can see that it would be unwise for you to do these things. And it would be unwise for you to then be in relationships with people who are doing these things. For example, if I had a friend that maybe we've been friends since we were 10 years old, and I know that they sell drugs, but we still hang out. Maybe we're 20, 30 years old, we still hang out. They never offer me drugs. They never try to convince me to use drugs, but I, I've known them all this time, and I know that they sell drugs. Well, say we're driving down the road together, and I get pulled over by the police, and they slip some cocaine under my chair right? Well, if the police search the car, who's going to jail? I'm going to jail, right? This is a result of my decisions. Maybe I don't even use cocaine. Maybe I've never even touched it. Maybe I've never even seen it before, but I'm still going to jail. This was a result of my decisions to associate with somebody who's into a livelihood that would be unwise. So with this wisdom, you'll make better choices, not only about your own life, but about who to involve in your life. But if other people are choosing to do these things, you should never look down on them. You should never think negatively about them. That's their choices. And they're experiencing the results of those decisions. But you'll need to cultivate the wisdom to make decisions that are helpful and beneficial for you. And this is the wisdom that's helping you to be able to do that to get started with the moral conduct section. We have another question here as well. So let's see. What about business like social media which have a gray area it has both beneficial effects to come and harmful effects to some there's no harm in working at a social media company there's nothing about providing computer code that allows people to talk and allows people to discuss things that is a harmful livelihood uh, there's nothing harmful in that the people that are experiencing harm through experiencing social media, this is based on their own cravings, their desires, their attachments. I use social media all the time. I use it to share the teachings of the Buddha. I don't cause harm through the way that I interact on social media, so therefore harm doesn't come to me on social media. If you look in our Facebook groups, there's no hostileness, there's no bitterness, there's no aggression or hostility. You can see all the Facebook groups that I operate. There's nobody who's speaking bitter and harsh and hostile in any of those groups. You can look on my personal, Facebook page, you won't see any kind of bitterness or hostility, either from me or from other people either. There's nobody who speaks that way through any of the Facebook groups or the a personal profile that I have. So it's not the code or the website that is producing any kind of harm. It's individuals who are choosing to interact on those sites that are either maybe scamming or they're having craving or they're doing other different things. So there's nothing harmful about a social media a company who's choosing to provide a service that allows people to connect. 
but it's the people who are connecting into that that are now operating through craving, anger, and ignorance or those pollutions that we're going to be talking about when we get to chapter eight, that you'll be able to see how each individual is choosing certain choices that then produces unwholesome results in their life. But a social media company and anything like that, it's not going to be a livelihood that is causing harm. These are the natural laws of existence. They're timeless. There's nothing that needs to change about the teachings of the Buddha that is going to uh, be something like this. Uh, This is just computer code that is out there on a server. It's not providing, uh, it's not causing any harm through the action of coding and putting that onto a server. It's the individuals who are interacting there that are then choosing to make decisions like scamming or other kinds of things that is actually causing the harm. Okay. So I don't see any other questions here. So what I'll do just to wrap up our class is just kind of summarize what we've been talking about, which is right speech. We've been talking about not causing harm through our verbal conduct, but also remembering that this is all communication, verbal, text, chat, post, emails, all your communication. If you're practicing harmlessness through your speech, then harm won't come back to you. You can get to a point where you don't have bitterness and hostility and anger and any of that stuff in your life because you're not putting it out, so therefore it's not coming back to you. And then we talked about right action, which is not causing harm through your bodily action, ensuring that all your bodily actions are harmless. If you've ever been around Thailand long enough, you'll see people walking through a crowd where Thai people will even hold their clothes against their body as they're walking through a a crowd, making sure that their loose clothing isn't even brushing up against somebody. They're very deliberate, very intentional in the way that they walk through a crowd. And then there's right livelihood. Right livelihood is how you decide to sustain your life, ensuring that you're not causing harm through your livelihood. And by not causing harm through your livelihood, then you can have a long lasting livelihood and it could be there to help you to be able to provide support for you to be able to purchase things like food, clothing, water, shelter, and medical care. Okay, so this is the moral conduct section of the Eightfold Path. And what I'm going to be doing in our next class is I'm going to be sharing with you the mental discipline section. This is next Sunday. We're going to be studying right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Because in order to implement the moral conduct, you're going to need some mental discipline or be able to control your mind. When the Buddha taught during his lifetime, he taught right view, which is teaching people that your own mind is causing your own discontent feelings. But then right after that, he would start teaching people the moral conduct. You can see where he talks about this. Because if you're interested in getting to a peaceful and joyful mind in a peaceful and joyful life, if you're causing harm through your moral conduct, this harm is just going to keep coming back to you over and over and over and over and over again. So you need to kind of shut down your harmful conduct through your speech or actions in your livelihood. As long as you're causing harm, this harm is going to keep coming back to you. So the Buddha would teach right view and then right away help people to learn about how to improve their moral conduct. So depending on where you are in your journey, this might be an area that you need to now focus a good amount of time in over the next several months is developing your right speech or right action in your right livelihood. Dialing this in closer and closer. When I was working on this, I would review the five factors of well-spoken speech in the morning before I would go out. And then I would go out and have certain conversations and interact in the world. Maybe at lunchtime, I would review the five factors of well-spoken speech. And I would say, hey, what are the conversations I had today? Did I practice all five factors? What situations did I not practice the five factors? And where can I improve? And then after lunch, I would have more conversations. And then sometimes in the evening, I would even review the five factors of well-spoken speech again. And I would do this and dial this in closer and closer and closer and closer. So you're going to need to revisit this multiple times in your journey to enlightenment. And you have this in the books. You have posters and different images that I created. You can take screenshots of these things. And that way, when you have it on your phone, you can be reviewing it. So say you're getting ready to go talk to a lawyer or say you're going into a business meeting or say there's some other impactful discussion you're about to have. You could actually be reviewing the five factors of well-spoken speech before you go in to those conversations and being sure that you have the full wisdom of what you need in order to practice in those situations. Okay, so thank you all for your questions. Thank you for your interest to learn and practice the teachings of the Buddha. Perhaps we'll see you guys in one of these future classes. This um, week, I'm going to be teaching starting tomorrow a five-day course, which is called Foundation in the Path to Enlightenment. It starts tomorrow at 9 a.m. And each day, 
from Monday through Friday. It's from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Anybody's welcome here at the temple, and I'm going to be live streaming it and having Zoom available as well. So thank you all for joining. Perhaps we'll see you in the future. Have a lovely rest of your day. Sawadikha. Sawadikha. Okay, we'll see you, Pat. Again, for watching, enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.